If you want to boil it down to its simplicity, it is like, why can't we do things that we've never been able to do when we are managing data at the speed of sound, where we can literally make decisions in millisecond speed because of this data. And we're seeing that with driverless cars and things like that. So the world is getting there, but we spend a lot of time working with our customers to help them envision the art of the possible. Our world has immense challenges. The question is, can AI really help us solve them? Mike Betzer, CEO of Hypergiant, breaks down how Hypergiant is working towards these AI solutions. Even though Hypergiant is a software company, learn how their team sometimes builds hardware products to show just how AI software can solve problems. They understand the power of making AI solutions tangible. IT Visionaries is brought to you by Salesforce Platform. If you love the thought leadership on this podcast, Salesforce has even more meaty IT thoughts to chew on. Take your company to the next level with in-depth research and trends right in your inbox. Subscribe to a newsletter tailored to your role at salesforce.com slash newsletter. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest. He is the CEO of a company called Hypergiant, Mike Betzer. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Excited to be with you. Now listen, when you're team approached us about, hey, we should do a show together. I was, we were like, oh, this sounds cool. And then when I read the description, I was like, this sounds very cool. <laughs> uh, I, for our audience who has not been to Hypergiant, I want to read this portion. Hypergiant is exactly spelled as you would think. It's H-Y-P-E-R-G-I-A-N-T.com. That's hypergiant.com. Everyone can check it out. But a better world is their headline website or their featured segment on their front page of the homepage of the website have a global problem. Yeah, we're working on that too. At Hypergiant, we believe in solving the world's biggest challenges with elegant technology solutions. That's why we are constantly innovating and focused on the application of artificial intelligence for good from carbon capture to spacesuits to forest fire prevention. We've prototyped technology that has changed industries. You got like this, I don't know how to describe like obelisk type machine like in, in a forest. I mean, it's pretty sweet. Mike, what is it that you guys are doing to address that statement? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great, great introduction. And uh, we're so excited. You know, at the end of the day, we are an AI company that takes this mass amount of data and we help us make better decisions with that data. I mean, that's as simple. If you want to boil it down to its simplicity, it is like, why, why can't we do things that we've never been able to do when we are managing data at the speed of sound, where we can literally mm -hmm. make decisions in millisecond speed because of this data. And we're seeing that with driverless cars and things like that. It's, so the world is getting there, but we spend a lot of time working with our customers to help them envision the art of the pop the art of the possible because everyone is so used to doing things the same way so when we start yeah. saying wait a minute you know now that we have image data from satellites all over the world can't we do things with more intelligence than waiting for someone to call in to say there's a forest fire as an example <laughs> you know it's like we should see this stuff before we need to wait on a human to call somebody to say hey i think there's a fire it's like hmm I mean, you know, and we're getting there, right? As more and more satellites are out there, as we're getting more real-time yeah. image data, as we're alerting about problems. And anyway, I'm going on and on about what we do, but uh, that's what, that bottom line is the world, everything is a sensor. There's image data, there's data everywhere. Let's leverage that data to make the world a better place. Yeah, and the, the reason why I was so interested in having you and hi, your company on the show was because we've heard AI being used for a lot of great things, right? I'm not trying to diminish AI. We've heard it used for marketing, for e-com, hey, better engaging, better experiences. I'm not gonna lie, when it comes to ad tech, it's kind yeah. of not that interesting, you know, like more relevant ads. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I can see how that helps. And then we've heard operationally how AI can help airlines, logistics, all these different companies make better decisions. But I, you're the first guy or the first company that I've said like that wants to solve like these big, huge problems that um, 
all of us are subjected to, right? So like you mentioned a forest fire. Well, of course, yeah. everyone that lives near that is subjected to it. Uh, our producer who is on the call right now, Jana, she's from a boulder who, of course, their town got right. crushed by right. by a wildfire. Um, so these are massive things that you guys are attacking. I guess let's start with the problem. Who comes up with the problem you guys are solving? Is it your customers coming to you and saying, hey, we think we want to play a part in solving a global challenge? Or are you guys pitching a solution to the companies that you think have data that might find an answer. Yeah, the great thing for us is that our our customers severely know they need to change. We yeah. they know we must do something different. So although we do a lot of different things, where we are really focused is on space, defense, and critical infrastructure. So that yeah. is our primary focus, uh, and we are doing that because the world really bad things could happen to this planet. If we yeah. don't increase the way we think about defense, if we don't think about the way we, we manage space, I mean, information in space, information that's everywhere now, data that's everywhere now, and then critical infrastructure. You know, I live in Texas and, you know, we had the, the freeze in Texas where literally the entire state was shut down. I was yeah. shut down for 10 days. I mean, no water. It's like, this doesn't have to happen. There are ways to make this, to make us smarter about what we're doing. So we now have the luxury of just spending time with our customers. The army knows they need to operate differently. The army is sitting on tons of data to make yeah. sure people don't die, to make sure we engage correctly. The air force is looking at things so that we understand what's a threat, what's a friendly, what's happening. They, they get it. And that's why we're focused there because as much as I could focus on, like you said, I could focus to make Twitter have more AI in it or more, you know, help somebody engage with a customer with more knowledge. I'm like, okay, that's nice. Like an airline, you made that example. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't change the world. I'm trying to make our military smarter, make our government smarter, make our roads smarter, make our energy pipeline smarter. If we are ever attacked in this country, they're going to go after our critical infrastructure. Yeah, Common yeah. warfare says, shut down communication, shut down power, shut down water supply. Then what happens to the people? It's, it'd be pretty bad. I mean, we saw it. We got a little preview of it through a, um, the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack. When they shut down the Colonial Pipeline, people were like, yeah, well, I think we're going to run out of gas in like six days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. Was, and, yeah. And that was a, and that was a, that was just a, a cyber criminal, not, not a nation state, you know? Right. Um, who, who promised, hey, we'll turn it back on if you just give me some money. Sometimes the solution ain't that simple, right? right. <laughs> and, uh, and so when you're in the preventive space of these things, this is pretty crazy. I want to read off some of these uh, logos that you have listed on the website because I want our audience can get an idea of the size and scale of the problems you're tackling because this is what makes it so exciting. You're talking to comp like energy companies, uh, Mike has already mentioned aviation companies. He's got major manufacturers, but like specifically like not just GE, but GE Power. Uh, he already mentioned the U.S. Air Force, NASA, Schlumberger. So it's big oil, Homeland Security, like big, big hero companies trying to do huge things. When you think about the problems that AI can solve, I guess let's start there was like, it, how does it start? Does it start with yeah. like a hypothesis? Like, hey, I think this, right? And then you use AI to find it or do you have teams like looking at the data and be like, hey, I discovered this. Could that be used to solve something? Because I feel like a problem of these scales, it probably, someone has to ask the question first. So yeah, how does it go? So we've taken a very different approach to this. So AI is a massive opportunity and a yeah. massive problem because we haven't figured out the most efficient way to get models into production. Okay, we have all this data. What do I do with this data? And this data is now everywhere. Like we're working with Amazon on edge computing. So the cloud isn't just the cloud. The cloud can literally be the backpack of the warfighter. So the cloud is literally becoming mm. everywhere, which is pretty cool. So the way we start with AI is we start super small. We're like, okay. look, we're going to take one problem and we're going to look at one pipeline that goes from, you know, New Mexico to Houston. And we're going to leverage all of those sensors that are on that pipeline so that you stop rolling so many trucks for stupid reasons. 
because these companies are looking for efficiency and effectiveness. So okay. we'll start with a really small problem and then say, okay, that, that, that doesn't change the world. It helps them become more efficient. But if you play that forward, now these sensors are starting to make decisions of, I've got a problem here. I have to redirect. I have to redirect. And when our when the, the machine becomes so smart, it starts making those decisions for the people. And the people are now the overseer of all this data rather than a guy rolls a truck, he calls somebody else, hey, I think we have a problem here. We, you know, and then he talks to somebody else. Rolls. It's like, we need to move at the speed that is relevant for that problem. And today, we just don't move at that speed. So relevancy of speed is key. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you one other example and then, uh, I love talking about this stuff. When the Air Force doesn't know if it's a friendly or a foe, what do they do? They do the most, they, they assume everything's a foe and they right. scramble jets and jets fly all over, this, all over this country, all of the time, doing things to protect this country. And sometimes they're protecting them against birds or because somebody <laughs> stole a Cessna. And look, this person isn't a bad person. They, I mean, yes, they're a bad person, but they're not trying to cause harm. A person just went a little crazy and stole the Cessna. They're not trying to- Let's call to... him a prankster. Maybe a prankster. <laughs> yeah, yeah some, exactly. Some kid, yeah. some kid that's a punk kid that, you know, took their dad's uh, airplane keys. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Because you, so you have this plane who's not communicating correctly with the tower. Okay. So that's a silent, they're, they're flying silent. That's a problem because that's, yeah. that, they're not following protocol. But should you scramble jets from 300 miles away that cost $3 million just to scramble these jets and get them up in the sky? That's like, okay, th th there's an easier way to solve this. So we can, mm. when you start looking at ground data, tower data, satellite data, and you put that data together, you can tell pretty quickly that these are birds or that this is, this is, this is a prankster who stole the Cessna. So apply the right energy to solve that problem. The wonderful thing about our government today is we know we need to change. The government knows technology is their friend and they are ready to spend a lot of money with companies like us to help. Cause we just move really fast, right? And we don't, yeah. we don't work like, you know, 20 years ago, NASA built everything themselves. Now NASA outsource, outsources most things to other companies. So because we just, we act like entrepreneurs, we move a lot faster. Yeah. And also I think they, uh, well, I hope, I hope our leaders of our country also recognize that lack of investment is probably a weakness, right? Where if, where if you're not on par with whoever is your enemy, it's a, Probably yeah. a problem, right? No, like that's, it, uh, it's one yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And, and, you know, the thing we say, our country has done such an amazing job playing the away game. So we have, we have built strength all over this planet and we have more strength all over this planet than anybody. That's awesome. So that we're prepared to do what we need to do in many, many regions of this world. We haven't spent any time since World War II on our home game. If you look at our communications and our energy grid and all this stuff, this was all built just post-World War II. And yeah. It's time. I mean, our energy grid is protected by a wire fence. You know, it's like, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's not enough, you know? Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. And, uh, and our FAA terminals are uh, like the world's biggest video game. They're just blips on dots on the green dot matrix screens. And what, what it appears to me. I mean, I saw like uh, the FAA screens from like, you know, I'm going to age myself like in the 1980s, like on Die Hard and they look like green blips on us, you know, a dot matrix screen. Yeah. And I've seen the modern terminal. It doesn't feel like it's advanced <laughs> with everything. <It's>, else. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. So what we do, so of course we leverage our hyperdrive engine, which is the data yeah. ingestion and spit out model. So that's cool, but there's all kinds of ways to do that. Um, the key thing that we do is we will literally sit in that network operating center of that energy company for three days and we will watch the operators run, do their job. And it's like, oh, this, and they're looking at seven different screens. And you know, we've seen these knocks that have all of these monitors. And it's like, okay, that's really cool, but it's data overload. So we are entering mm -hmm. into an era of data overload. So yeah. you have to figure out me as an operator watching this region, 
what is the thing I must do in the next 60 seconds? And then I have to turn something on, off, elevate, escalate, minimize something. So instead of having 8,000 green dots, what are the three dots that matter to me? Know your mission, mm. know what you have to do next. So that's what we really help these operators do. So we will sit there with them and design, gamify the way they should be thinking about their job. And okay, it's cool you're looking at everything, but right now you have these two things that are flashing yellow, escalate them, show the area, what are they connected to? Oh, downstream effects are these five things. Oh, I have a hospital right here that could go off grid if I don't have this and I don't have this generator hot. So, you know, re remove the noise and just do what you have to do. And that's where we can leverage data to just make real decisions that are important at the speed you have to make those decisions. So that's leveraging data. That's AI done right, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think that you've identified it very simply, or very simply but eloquently, right? Which is, hey, data can probably identify a problem faster. So like if, if first, right? So if I can identify it first, then we can scramble all the help first. If you can help me through my decision trees, potentially, like you said, hey, do I need to, do I need to alert this? Do I not, not need to alert this? Is this a you know critical move? Is it a non-critical move? I can see that helping in many different ways. Now, you guys handle a lot of different projects. Uh, one of them uh, listed is, is this idea behind uh, carbon removal, uh, which is, of course, our lead sponsor is Salesforce, which we have to give a shout out to. And they're very much focused on doing an, supporting initiatives that are going to protect our planet. Give us an idea of how, you know, how does AI help carbon removal? Because... The problem as we understand it is, and, and I'll just, again, I know what I know, and of course you're here to correct me, but all, from what I understand it's like, it's, it, most of it's done over time. Like there's not like sudden, it's not quite like defense or uh, like if pipeline would be like disaster where it's like, oh, there's instantly got to patch it. Carbon's more like it's constantly, sl whether it's rapidly, slowly, it's constantly being produced and it's constantly, you know, the plants aren't pulling it down fast enough. So it's constantly, right. I guess, creating a surplus. How does, how does AI help in that situation? Because what, from what I know, it's very difficult to say like, oh, I could see something instantaneously changing that. Yeah, so, so what we did, and this is, how, this is how we work. Sometimes, we're not a hardware company, but sometimes we have to build hardware to show the art of the possible. So gotcha. my team built this bioreactor which is basically, and it's in the Smithsonian right now. So it's really cool that Hypergiant, a teeny little company like us, <laughs> has a bioreactor in the Smithsonian. So it's pretty cool. I'm going to be in DC in the next month and I'm going to go look at it, which will be kind of fun. Um, but um, we want to show, is there a way to just use intelligence of data to create a bioreactor that could leverage algae to create a better to improve the carbon footprint in a more rapid way. So if you put mm. algae in a perfect environment, because it grows so fast in a perfect environment, yeah. and it can really have an impact. So you're like, well, wait a sec. If this one bioreactor has the same impact as 50 trees, well, what if we had 10,000 of these little bioreactors? You know, this can do some, this can have some real impact. You know, it oh, can yeah. really help our, the carbon footprint. So it was an it was an exper it started out as an experiment to is there a way to leverage hardware and software to leverage AI to to make the carbon reactor the bioreactor uh, more efficient to know the speed that it can produce uh, what it needs to produce so that's how we leveraged AI on that one um, yeah so that was yeah so so we and we did the same thing like you said in the introduction we did the same thing with the helmet so. You know, when you when you're with the pilots that are flying these missions, they're the way they are looking at their data is so different than the way it is gamified for the kids that are playing games. And we're like, well, what if we just put all that data inside the helmet so they can just see this stuff on the sides of their screen? And it just gave them a much better, instantaneous way to access their data and see their data without like switching the screen, switching the screen. It's like. Here's the relevant data for you right now. Or, you know, we all, all have seen Top Gun where they're looking back to find, find out if there's a plane behind them. It's like, okay, we have ability to know if there's a plane behind you without having to turn around and see the plane. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that, that we work on. And, and then one other example I'll give you is, you know, we also set up um, 
you know, the army is moving forward with these remote combat vehicles, which is just like the coolest thing in the world. So instead of having humans walking out first and hitting landmines and things like that to, yeah. you know, let's let these remote combat vehicles lead the pack. So we designed a remote combat vehicle, small scale. It's about, you know, a couple of feet. And we said, look, let's just show you how you can, because they are building this. This is funded. It's a funded project, but we don't have the remote combat vehicle built yet. So we're like, look, we're going to just build a simple one. We're going to put sensors on this thing. The sensor can detect anything unique in the soil, anything that's not there. It does a bunch of image data. Um, and then we have a bunch of sensors that talk about the health of the remote combat vehicle. Is it getting hot? Is it going to break down? Does it need to go back to, to base? Do we need to detonate it because this thing is stuck? So, so we are now working with the Army to help the Army fighters be much more efficient and effective and safe in the battlefield, which is just like super cool. So we just love working on this stuff. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a, a hardware. Is there a hardware component component to your company as well? So you are got a lot of data scientists clearly m building AI models to help identify threats, problems, whatever the case may be, solutions. Yeah. But it sounds like there's also a hardware component because you mentioned that carbon yeah. reactor. You yeah. mentioned the the remote the remote vehicle. Give us an idea of how your like engineering team, I guess, is split in regards like who's working on what. Yeah. So we're we're not a hardware company. We are a software company. But my guys are like, look, I can I can build a remote combat vehicle with tools tools and technology. I can build just to to build a you know you can buy these little cars. <laughs> So my guys are like, look, it'd be cooler for us to show. And we just showed this at the AWS booth at Space Symposium. So mm -hmm. we were at the front of the AWS booth for three days showing our image data capability. And all we did is we watched everybody who walked by and anybody who came back the second time, we said, what is the probability that this person has been here? And we just started matching data. And then we would show them the data. You've actually walked by this booth seven times. Uh, and they're like, Oh my God, how did you know that I walked by? It's like, because we captured the image and it, and it mapped to the image data. So we're, we're doing some cool things with image data. Um, now, half the people came and said, oh, how do I get one of these remote rovers? I'm like, look, we just built this to demonstrate our capability. <laughs> so we are not a hardware company. And when it goes to prime time scale, we'll partner with, you know, whoever it may be that does the hardware. So ultimately, when it goes into production, we will not build remote combat vehicles. But sometimes... You have to do some things to let them see the art of the possible. It's hard to understand AI when it's just data in the cloud. So we're like, yeah. If, but if you do this correctly, I can enable you to make better decisions at the speed of relevancy for your situation. This is why I, I wanted to have you on the show specifically because I was like, man, these guys are like building actual solutions okay. because. One of the unique things about being host of IT Visionaries is we meet a lot of different leaders, tech leaders that are in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and we hear about their practical applications. But it always sounds like it's something that's just going to help another software layer. And so that's why I was really excited to have you on is like hearing about how like the actual machines that people are depending on. This, of course, there's software behind it, but like the actual machines are changing and, and possibly changing for the better for for humanity which is pretty insane yeah for yourself how did you get here because your background is more like my background in regards to you know for those who don't know look up mike he is from a company called chorus which was in at one point a combination of spread fast and another company lithium yeah. i went i came from that similar space i was at a company called xbeyond so social media management and software and marketing software a lot different than what you're doing today. How did you, how did, how did that happen? Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. So I've had a, a great journey and I've had the, the opportunity to work at amazing companies from MCI to a small company I built. I sold it to Siebel. I worked at Siebel and Oracle. Um, so ultimately I realized that every big brand was trying to stop social media and I'm like, you can't, you, which of course we all know now, but this was a long time ago, right? And, and, yeah, yeah, and they're trying realized, to put it back in the box. Like, yeah, hey, how like, do we stop these people from talking about my business? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The one guy on Twitter that goes on American Airlines and goes crazy and, and all of a sudden American Airlines brand is severely damaged, right? Um, yeah. So I built software to enable brands to respond to social at scale at the speed of, that is relevant. 
And we had great success in Coros and we built that company to be a very big, successful company. It's now owned by Vista Private Equity. And uh, so anyway, I was there loving my job, doing what, we, what I was doing. And uh, Ben Lamb, who was the founder of this company, um, is a very creative, successful entrepreneur. He brought me in because I am a scale guy. So I just like, I love to take a company from 20 million to 200 million and beyond. So that's kind of what mm. I love. It's like, okay, how do we build the repetition of doing really cool things in a, at a scale that makes sense? Um, and I don't have the military. I'm not from a military background. So this is a very different journey for me. So I have associated and connected with a bunch of amazing ex-military people that helped us understand the problems in military, the problems in critical infrastructure. Um, and as we look at this, it's like, this is so much cooler than solving this for our national security than it is solving it for somebody managing Twitter feeds. But it's the same. It's how do you leverage data at the speed that makes sense to solve a problem? And we're just working on really cool problems now. Yeah, I, I should say so. The uh, for for the people that are uh, again listening but haven't quite checked out Hypergiant's uh, website yet, I, I strongly encourage everyone to check out because they kind of identify some of the problems they're working on. The one thing that caught my eye was like the the city of the future. I don't know what else to call this, but like there you have a lot of graphics here, like where you're reimagining the world. If you you know, I I like asking some of our tech leaders if what you believe about your company comes true. Tell us what does our world look like if Hypergiant's able to build and build all the critical things that you're looking to build? Are you talking about a world where, you know, the, 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 um, cause I'm environmental, so I've said it multiple times on the show, but the, the algae reactor, it sounds like something that people should just have in their house. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then clean like, your air. there's probably, there's probably like a clean energy creation, whether it's nuclear, whether it's solar wind tidal, I don't know, but it's probably, going to be a way to power that all the time too so that yeah. it's constantly pulling carbon out i don't know but you tell me what does the world look like if hypergiant hits all of its goals yeah so i think you're right and we're actually now talking to hardware providers for the bioreactor to partner with them and say look we've got we've got the prototype we have the design now let's partner together and let's go do this thing um in this so i was in dallas this week and um uh, pro jane is one of our investors uh, and I had the luxury of going in the helicopter this week uh, to look at um, the city of the future that they're working on in Dallas. And it's really mm. cool. And when you look at if when you when you look at what's happening in in the sector of Dallas, it is one of the largest truck depots where tank, you know, the, the crates that go on top of trucks right. and train station in it's one of the top largest in the United States. It, it's it's at max capacity so now they're I've driven at, past it it's yeah, huge it's, it's uh, insane. It's a... <laughs> and if you're up in the sky in a helicopter you really appreciate how big it is and every yeah. big supplier of goods is all around that from yep. amazon to walmart to they're all there and and i've never ever seen so many semis or truck or or train uh cargo beds at one place it's just like um, unbelievable so now they're looking at how do we leverage AI to make more decisions faster based on what we need to do to be more efficient because they have to improve efficiency. The trains are full. You can't, you yeah. can't move any more boxes on these trains. So we're talking about driverless vehicles to get things from place to place. We're talking about a simple thing of image data to understand if there's rust on a, on a device that is moving these cargos around because if that device goes down for three days, everything in the supply chain breaks. Yeah. Right. So these are, you know, these are these big cranes that just move these box cars, you know, automatically. And so we, we worked with the army to detect rust on their vehicles because in the army, if vehicles break, people die. And so yeah, we worked with, the, spot. yeah, you're in a bad spot. <laughs> and, and, Generally speaking, the people that are on that tank could tell you this tank is probably at risk. And we're like, oh my God, so we have the data. We know it's at risk. There's a camera on the person. You see the rust on this device. You see that this one sensor, that this part of the, the vehicle is overheating. So what we did for the army, we're like, wait, could we do that for the smart city to make the city smarter? 
I mean, there's mm. cameras everywhere looking at everything. So when you look at the camera data, the satellite data, the data on the ground, and you triangulate that data, we can make that city smarter. We can use energy in that city in a better way. So that's some of the stuff we do is just, but, but today we are really focused on space, defense, and critical infrastructure because they are so ready to buy and they, you know, the government has funded it. There's a lot, of, there's billions and billions of dollars being set up to invest in these, these, this new knowledge and the way to handle this new knowledge. So it's, it's just, it's a great time for us and we happen to be at the right place at the right time. And we've spent three years just really understanding the military so that we can help them. Uh, because, you know, I have this picture behind me for a reason. You know, this is the way, this is the way people used to protect each other. They would build a big wall. Well, yeah, he's I, got the Great Wall of China yeah. behind him for anyone who's not uh, watching it on YouTube right now. And I have that there just to remind me all the time that uh, that's not the future. And that is no, you can't build a wall big enough. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and everybody's trying to steal everybody's data. And these satellites are going up at record speed. And there's going to be thousands and thousands of satellites up in the sky all over the place. So we're even look, working on projects to help remove the, the garbage that's in the space area. So uh, anyway, we're, we're, blessed. we're blessed to be working on such cool problems. Uh, we're staying really humble about it. We're just trying to do our part to try to make this country, first and foremost, a stronger, safer, better smarter place so that we can make better decisions. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of indicators to tell you if there's a problem with the water supply, a problem with the grid, a problem. I mean, yeah. it, there's, uh, you know, the cool thing is there's sensors everywhere. So the question is who's reading those sensors and how do we make better actions, take better actions because of those sensors? Yeah. Like you said, right. The, the soldiers could already tell you that there's a problem, but how can you react faster? So, or, you know, the big whole goal would be almost preventative, right? Like we're, we're, just, saying, hey, exactly. we're not going to allow it to ever get to a point where it's even a decision tree problem. Like it doesn't that, need to be a problem. That's right. Let's just solve it right now. It was awesome having you on the show. We were excited. Like I said, when we started reading about the company, we're like, no, this is going to be cool. It, it makes, you know, people like me who, I don't know what I could contribute possibly, but you know, it makes people, for me, it's exciting to hear that people are tackling such big problems. Um, I can't stress enough how often we turn down people that want to be on IT visionaries that are working on the next like chat filter. I'm like, yo, I don't. <laughs> I know. It's like, I'm it's not like, saying what you're doing is not important, but I was like, it's not as what you're doing yeah. is very interesting. I'm very fascinated by it. Mike, I want to say thank you for joining us on IT visionaries and sharing the story of Hypergiant. But I want to do say one thing before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce platform the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Mike, this is where we ask you questions outside of the world of work so our audience can get to know you better. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. All right? Ready. All right, so since you have the Great Wall of China behind you, have you ever been there? I ran a marathon on the Great Wall of China. And how'd you do? Uh, I completed it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> 7,000 steps. It was a long race. I, well, I, you know, now I'm really interested in this because uh, there are parts of the Great Wall of China where there's like, I don't think people who haven't seen it can appreciate it are very steep. I mean, like, it's like a ladder. Like you need to go, yeah. you're going up and down ladders. Did, is, did you have to cross those during your marathon? We did. We were four hours outside of Beijing and there were times when you were on your hands and, you know, you were literally, you know, kind of going up a very, very <laughs> steep slope, but not a lot of that, but there was some of that. So it's kind of like a Spartan race too. It was kind of like <laughs> a Spartan race and I was very happy to be done. <laughs> For yourself, are you a, do you like ancient history or because you, I would assume so because that's behind there. Are you a fan of history? I am a fan of history. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of history from the standpoint of learning so that we become smarter, you know, and just looking like I, like I even love, although this is ancient history, but I love even looking at the people that built America and the way the energy grid was done in America. And, you know, you go look back 50 years, a hundred years. It's, I, I just love looking at what people did without the technology because we are so blessed and yeah. it's so much easier now and it's like there's no reason for us not to be better than we are yeah and uh, when because because you're a fan of this i always say this myself i think it's fascinating that for example we have all this technology but yet we're still like we have good strong hypothesis but it's still hard to imagine how did the egyptians build the pyramids it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's all about manpower. 
But now we're going to move, we must move away from manpower to use yeah. brain power. That's, that's the whole big thing. Because uh, there's a lot of bad actors in this world, and we need to make sure that we are, the good actors are working harder than the bad actors to protect everything that we hold dear. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, I want to say thank you again for joining us on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing your run, your story, and jump from social media management to solving some of the world's most complicated problems. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked for companies like Hypergiant to, to be successful because, I mean, obviously, I think the world will be better off for it. And I look forward to having one of your, um, your reactors in my house. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. No, this is great. Thank, thank you for the time. Uh, we are very excited about what we're doing. And uh, I think the future is going to be a great, it's going to be a great place.